tell us about a project you're working on these days. So one of the big projects that uh, we recently finished had to do with modeling of time series data. Uh, this, this problem arises quite naturally within the context of systems. Uh, so you can imagine a distributed system uh, and you can use any standard monitoring tool to collect a lot of data which is in the form of time series. So for instance, resource usage like how much CPU or how much memory you are using or what is the disk I.O. level. Once you have this kind of time series data, then how do you, uh, how do you infer some knowledge out of it? And the typical way to do it is to uh, use some time series models. And once you have these models, then you can use uh, them to then give in some new data to determine whether that data comes from a normal operating system or there is some fault or anomaly in the system. More concretely, the approach that we used for time series modeling used uh, autoregressive models. So um, you are talking about analyzing large amounts of data. Uh, what are the general approaches that are being used these days and what are your favorite uh, approaches? Apart from, um, say, basic time series modeling, in general there is a lot of uh, interest in using data mining and machine learning techniques to model data arising from large systems. Uh, if you, In terms of data mining, you can, you can think of the techniques as, as either uh, classification approaches, so for instance, support vector machines, which can help you classify a bunch of data as coming from a normal or an abnormal system. You could also have uh, exploratory analysis approaches, for instance, cluster data clustering, which is a standard technique where you try to, uh, when you do not have labels associated with data, for instance, whether when you don't know whether it it comes from a normal and abnormal system, then you try to see if there are some inherent clusters in the data. Uh, so, so in general, I would say that data mining and machine learning are, are big areas from where people are borrowing tools for analyzing system data. So you mentioned uh, data mining and machine learning and their use in systems research. So most of that activity is using uh, existing techniques and tools or are there new algorithms and techniques being developed within systems research community as well? So I would say broadly people are using as existing uh, algorithms, but it is with the caveat that no algorithm or technique will work out of the box. So one of the interesting challenges in, in systems research, uh, so I would say it's both a challenge and an opportunity is that uh, the assumptions that the machine learning techniques make sometimes do not hold for your data. So what you might need to do is to either pre-process your data. So for instance, pre-process your data for some outliers or noise, uh, or post-process the results of these, uh, uh, these techniques to then make the inference that you need to make. So one, one source that actually helps both with pre-processing or post-processing is the fact that you are not getting this data from an unknown system. Most of the time you have a lot of domain knowledge uh, about the system. Uh, so you can incorporate some of that domain knowledge and, and improve the performance of these basic uh, algorithms. So uh, tell us about a specific experiment or a specific set of data that you collected where you have successfully used the approach that you just mentioned. So. For me, most of my work has focused on your product uh, at NEC. It's called a system invariant analyzer. And there, what we did was that we collected a lot of time series data. And then what we tried to do was that we tried to infer dependencies between uh, two or more time series. So to give an example, if you're running a web service, then you should see some correlation between the time series that represents the number of HTTP requests per second versus, say, the CPU utilization or the memory utilization at your web server. Uh, now, so for, at, at the first step, we learned these, these relationships, and these relationships are represented in the form of autoregressive models with exogenous inputs. Now, 
that's a very well known machine learning uh, time series modeling technique but but people have taken this and and generalized it and there is a well known method called uh, uh, lasso which is a generalization of this auto regressive uh, modeling which can do the same thing which is to infer relationships uh, across multiple variables so that that these relationships then represent our what is the normal behavior of the system and then what happens is that now you use these relationships to analyze data in an online fashion and when some of some or most of these relationships are broken then you know that there is something wrong with the system so that that's the detection part of, of some fault or anomaly detection and then given that you are sure that there is something wrong with the system then you go ahead and look at exactly which relationships are broken so for instance most of the invariance or relationship associated with the server is broken so maybe something wrong with the with the web server so this is the overall framework now to give you an example of a particular domain knowledge that that we used in this setting so for instance if you know so one area where you can use domain knowledge is is any given technique will raise lot of alarms now given your your knowledge of uh, what is the average cpu utilization of your system or the relationship between how what kind of content you are hosting on your web server you can you can do an intelligent uh, post processing of alarms to say reduce the false positives otherwise you might be seeing too many alarms so that's one example of of the project that i've been involved in uh, another project that i started but uh, we still have lot more work to do is that if you are given lot of log data then how do you process this data uh, to infer some interesting uh, information out of it so now on the face of it you can think of it as the standard text mining uh, problem from machine learning or data mining but one thing that you keep in mind is that you have some advantages here because the log is uh, is in general has some structure and a lot of times people use the same uh, logging frameworks like log for java uh, or some other well known um, apache standard to generate these logs so now you can so now you are not just doing some unstructured text mining but you can incorporate this domain knowledge in in mining these logs so these two projects come to mind we are talking about systems that try to understand the performance of deployed systems from what i understand and when you are collecting data from real world systems you mentioned web servers and servers in general what kind of data quality issues do you run into and how do you manage that so first issue is always uh, measurement noise when you have a lot of data it's easier to compare data from different sources and and detect the level of noise but it's extremely hard to pinpoint why that noise is there uh, so you have to live with measurement noise another issue is is missing samples so uh, despite your best efforts you might never be able to collect uh, all the samples that you intend intended to a third issue can be related to missing or uh, uh, so when so you might you typically you time stamp each sample but in a distributed system because of clock drifts and stuff you might have to post process to align your samples but in partic- particularly when you're working with the time series data so these are these three issues are the are the biggest that i have encountered in my work and how do you manage these data quality issues so actually that's a little bit of an art and uh, so there are standard things like you can do for noise you can do smoothing uh, if you are missing samples and and if you just if you just search for techniques for handling missing samples in time series then that's a very well studied field uh, but the standard way is to try to infer the value of those samples uh, but a lot of it also depends on on trying to incorporate some domain knowledge to get a better estimate so it's it's a little bit of a trial and error approach uh, i would say so we the the only thing that you can do is that start with some standard approaches use your intuition uh, and then and then the domain knowledge to make sure that these kind of in the process these pre processing of data does not influence your results
And when you're cleaning data, are there some things that uh, we have to be careful about? Uh, so I guess the, the biggest thing to be careful about is to make sure that you are not uh, doing something to the data that would make the subsequent results useless. So for instance, it is well known that so a well-known technique for eliminating noise in time series is to smooth the noise. But then if your follow-up modeling is about, depends on the correlation between different time series, then it is well known that uh, if you over-smooth the time series, then you will start seeing artificial correlations because smoothing always increases uh, correlation. So that is one thing that, that you have to, that's a small example of something that you have to keep in mind. But in general, there is a danger of uh, uh, learning something useless because a lot of times what happens is that you don't work with the raw data. You try to extract some features out of that raw data and then do learning based on that. So one, in terms of, you know, ending up with some, some um, results, that seem meaningful but are actually not. There are some uh, papers. There the problem was that you are getting a time series in an online fashion and you are chopping it in it into smaller subsequences. And these smaller subsequences are your features and then you try to cluster them to figure out whether the behavior that you are seeing at time t is same as some t minus, at, at, is the same as some behavior in the past. Now this see, on the face of it, this seems like a reasonable approach but that paper shows that uh, looking at subsequences, actually, uh, there are some issues with it that can um, uh, influence the results. So that's a definitely a good paper to look at to look at these bigger dangers. Also, in 2008, there was a paper, and there they give well-known case studies. And one of the things that they point out is that a lot of times the problem arises because you are using data out of context. So typically it happens that you go and get data that somebody else has collected and then use it as input to your algorithm or for your purposes. And sometimes using data out of context can lead to results that are not uh, strictly correct. So there is, at the micro level, you have to be careful about these pre-processing steps, but at the macro level, when you're, especially when you are processing the data into some other feature and using those features, you have to be, you have to somehow go back and validate your, your main results to see what you are getting is meaningful. In your work, have you been able to generalize an approach that almost always works for outlier detection? So it's hard. So here is the challenge with outliers. So suppose that you are trying to infer what is the normal behavior of the system. So then in the you at least have to start with some data set where you can assume that. So the strictest assumption is that it doesn't have any outliers, but that is rarely true in in real world. So one of the so you could do one of the two approaches. One is that uh, you try to uh, do some exploratory analysis of the data, for instance, some form of clustering. To, to make sure that the level, the number of outliers is small, in which case you can either throw them out of your data set, and if you cannot, then you just, you are sure that the level of outliers is not so high that it will impact your model. One, another approach that I, that I used in one of my works is an iterative approach. So what I did was that I first built a model, then I, I so it's similar to, uh, to cross-validation approaches that people typically use in machine learning. So what you do is that you partition your your training data into a number of bins, and then you use you use some bins as uh, for training, and then the other bins uh, as test cases or validation cases. So that can tell you how robust your model is to to outliers. So I would say that these are the two standard approaches that everyone uses, and I also use in my work. Great. So we're talking about analyzing large amounts of data and without storage of this large amounts of data, none of this would be possible. So what do you use in your daily work to store and manage this data when you're doing research? So I guess you could address the storage issue from several dimensions. So the first one is definitely archival. 
everyone should store multiple copies of their their data the second issue then that comes up which is not strictly archival is that uh, a lot of times what happens is that you have a workflow or a pipeline for going from raw data to the end result and there are a lot of there is lot of intermediate data and often i, I so i try to save this intermediate data as often as i can because typically so typically when you take the raw data and process into some feature and then do some data mining using these features then if you don't save these intermediate features then you might have to keep going and spending a lot of time in regenerating them every time you you change something down the pipeline so that's that these are the two aspects that you have to take care of a third aspect that you run into when you are trying to analyze massive amount of data which we did run into here at NEC labs is that sometimes i io disk io can become a bottleneck so then we invested some money in setting up a server cluster with a with a uh, fast network attached storage uh, sitting behind it so that io is not a bottleneck so i would say three aspects archival making sure you have nice io bandwidth and the last one is uh, storing your intermediate results uh, is is three aspects related to storage that come to my mind what programming languages and other tools do you use in your work i typically use r and python uh, in graduate school i used to use matlab as well but then once i graduated so i switched to r i also use basic uh, shell scripting and awk scripts for for uh, some data pro processing so i would say these four things great so today we learned a lot about the high level goals of data analysis and what are some of the approaches that you're applying at your work as well as some concrete tips on how to go about dealing with noisy data which is what we have to deal with when we're dealing with measurements from real systems we hope to apply some of uh, your experiences to improve our research thank you thank you